really this is going to be relevant regardless of where you're at. And uh, we're going to, what I'm going to talk about is uh, what we're seeing as far as efficacy of BT cotton and how it's, how, how it's changed over the, the, a few years. And uh, really give a snapshot. I'm going to concentrate on, on Texas. Of course, that's where we've collected a lot of data. But we've, I've got a lot of data that we have collected also out of the Mid-South area, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Mississippi, and Tennessee. And then actually we've got a lot of data out of the, uh, off of, uh, from Georgia up through uh, Virginia as well. And the picture's pretty much the same uh, wherever we go. We've got, a, we've got a series of toxins. So these are BT toxins. It's a little protein crystal that the bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis produces. And it's, it, it, it's toxic to the insect. And essentially what it does, insect will consume this crystalline protein. It kind of binds to the gut and essentially makes an ulcer. And then the gut contents of that insect will, will go through the, the ulcer or into the body and then it ends up killing the insect. That's how it works. So when they first introduced BT in 1996 in corn and cotton, it was all uh, this, a Cry-1A. And in cotton it was Cry-1AC and it was in all the old Bogard. And that was the original single toxin uh, event in cotton. Now when they introduced Bogard, bollworm was not the intended target. It was tobacco budworm and uh, pink bollworm, depending on where you're at. And, uh, and so, as what we saw when they first released this is, heck, we got great control of tobacco budworms, but we saw some cotton bollworms that would be able to survive even when it was first introduced. So Cry-1AC was never a lights out toxin on bollworm. It was pretty effective, but at times it would, it would fail. Then they came out with the dual gene cottons. Uh, primarily it was, you know, Bolgar 2 came out, was the same toxin, then they added something a little bit different. Cry, it was a Cry 2 AB. And the Cry 2 acts different, it binds to the gut different. So now you, it's, it's like having two insecticides, uh, you know, in the same plant. So the plant expresses these proteins. So now we got two modes of action essentially going on uh, from these BTs. Uh, Twin Link has done the same thing. Now their toxins are a little bit different. They use a Cry-1AB rather than a Cry-1AC, but the mode of action is the same, and a Cry-2AE rather than the Cry-2AB. But again, the mode of action is the same. So it's essentially the same as Bogar 2. Wide Strike's a little different. It's got the old Cry-1AC, but then they added something different, Cry-1F. And Cry-1F has always been predominantly a fall armyworm type of toxin. Uh, it does have some bollworm activity, but in, in, in reality, it's even weaker on bollworm than the Cry-1AC, and I'll, I'll show you some data on this. Uh, then moving forward, they started adding the VIP, whether it's Wide Strike 3, Bogard 3, or Twin Link Plus. And the VIP is just, again, it's a third mode of action. It's a completely different BT toxin. And, um, and that's, this is essentially where we're at now, is these the, uh, three, three gene cottons. You can still get, the course, the two, the two gene. You can't get this one anymore. Uh, but all the companies are moving toward these three, three gene cottons. And the other thing to note is that when we're looking at BT cotton, you're essentially looking at the very same thing that's in corn. <coughs> and so what happens in corn is going to influence what we see in cotton. And so if you look across both crops, corn and cotton, you're looking at really just four types of technologies, Cry-1As, Cry-1F, Cry-2As, and the VIP-3A. So what we've done is over the last uh, three years uh, predominantly, is we've gone out and either collected or people have sent us uh, bollworm population. They may be collected out of cotton, they may be collected out of corn or soybeans or, or uh, milo, uh, whatever. And we'll bring these, they'll ship these to us and we'll rear them in the lab for one generation and then when we get that egg hatch, we'll, we'll conduct these bioassays. 
And what we'll do is we'll take the different toxins and we overlay them on these assays at different doses. And then we'll put this freshly hatched worm on here and we'll see how they respond. And then what we'll do is we'll test a susceptible laboratory strain. And here we call it the Benzon. It's a commercially available strain. And then we can compare how our field strains do relative to this laboratory strain. And we compute, we'll, we'll calculate these LC50s. And the LC50 is essentially, it's the, the concentration of the toxin that kills 50% of the population. So we'll do this with the probits analysis. And then we'll compare our field population to our susceptible. And so like if you had an LC50 of 100 here uh, versus an LC50, or a 10 here versus an LC50 of say 100 of that susceptible strain, then that would be a tenfold uh, resistance ratio or tenfold more tolerant to the insecticide. And so that's what we're really gonna pay a lot of attention to. Now if we, first one we're gonna look at, this is the Cry1AC, so this is the first one, uh, this is the one that we saw in Bogard. It's in everything that's out there essentially as far as cotton goes. But you, we ran all these different populations collected through the state. These black lines show the susceptible populations. And these other ones, this is a susceptible as well, out, out of a different lab. And these are our field strains, and this is the response. So anything that's a 10x or higher resistance ratio, we're considering that resistant. And if you look in, a, in a 2018, we only had one population come back as susceptible. If you look at the one out of uh, Wellington, which is right here, so this would be as close as we can get to southwest Oklahoma, that resistance ratio to that population is over 230. So it's highly resistant to Cry1AC. Now if we look at Cry2, this is the other toxin in Bogard 2, it's the other toxin in a Twin Link. We're seeing over 70% of our populations coming back as resistant. And again, you can see where we collected these all. Uh, two of them right, right where I was at, we collected both these that came back as susceptible. Again, this one up by southwestern Oklahoma, it has over a 50-fold resistance. In fact, it was so, it exceeded our highest dose we were testing, so we really couldn't get a really good value on it. It was the most resistant population we collected. And it, came, and it was collected out of Bogard II uh, near Wellington. And, that, and we had a lot of complaints. I got calls from guys, well, southwest Oklahoma and all through this area of Texas with uh, worms coming through dual gene cotton. And that's why. So if you look at Cry1F, this is the other toxin that's, say, in, in Wide Strike or Wide Strike 3. Everything's resistant. And as I mentioned, it's not a very good toxin for bowworm. It, it just doesn't perform. Everything's uh, higher than we can really measure at the doses we can put in those uh, little bioassays. So it's just not a bowworm material. So when you're looking at a product like Wide Strike, it's really dependent on that Cry1AC to carry that technology. The good news is, is the VIP technology. When we look at the VIP technology across our populations, nothing comes back as being resistant to the VIP technology, 0% with resistant ratios of 10 or higher. So it does, it does look highly active. If you look again, the, in fact, if you look at our populations, most of these are negative. And so they're actually more s sensitive to the VIP than our laboratory strain, which kind of tells us, well, we're not so sure maybe our laboratory strain should be the, the right strain we're testing these against. Again, here's the Wellington population. It was a minus 6.7 in its resistance ratio. But curious enough, we've had a couple of populations that come back with positive values. One of those, well, both of them actually came out of College Station, Texas. Here's one that was about a two-fold. And then here's one that's a 4.2. Now, the 4.2 one we'll get back to because it's a really interesting population. I actually collected that out of... Uh, Leptra corn, and Leptra corn is a corn that expresses the VIP technology, and we shouldn't be able to collect those out of there, but we did. So as you can see, overall, all the BT technologies are compromised with the exception of the VIP, the VIP technology. 
And this is the reason we see worms coming through BT cotton. Now that doesn't mean that you're, if you get you know, some worms laid in the BT cotton that they're all gonna survive. You know, it's, it's, it, you're still gonna kill a proportion of that population. I'll show you a little bit of data on that. It's, we're, we're not talking immunity here. We're talking just lower susceptibility to the toxins. If you look at our, our, our results over time, so this is in 2016, 2017, and 2018, these are the percentages of populations that we tested that came back as resistant. So CRY1AC in 2016, 40%, 80% to CRY2, 2017, 100% uh, for CRY1AC, and about 77 for CRY2. The, the CRY1F is essentially going to be 100 across the board. Uh, and then 2018, 90% of CRY1AC and about 68 for CRY2. And this data shows Texas and the whole Mid-South area kind of combined uh, together. So let's look a little bit at field performance. As I mentioned, we're not talking about immunity here. You can still get some, some performance out of these technologies. Let's see how they stack up. This is a test, uh, this is out of 2017. What we're looking at here is percentage of damaged fruit with a non-BT, a wide strike, a wide strike three, a Bogart two, and a twin link. That's really my threshold there. That's where I'm gonna treat it. But you can see we're getting really high injury in the non-BT, almost over 50% of the fruit had worm damage in it, so very high pressure. Wide strike was up around 30, wide strike three, was almost you know about 18, but what's real interesting here it was all square damage. We didn't pick up any bow damage in the wide strike three. Bogard two, uh, about 10 or 12 percent, and twin link was up again close to around 18 percent injury. So you can see at least here with the VIP, because on wide strike three, if you think about it, the cry one F is compromised completely. The cry one S A C is nearly compromise completely. That's all the VIP technology carrying it. And so you do still see potentially injury with Wide Strike 3. If you look at Bogard 3, and I threw this in just so we could do that, because it still has the Cry 2, which is providing some activity. This difference in activity here, and we're, again, we're looking at percent damage fruit between Bogard 2 and Bogard 3. That's the VIP carrying the Bogard 3 in this case. So Again, very high uh, damage in your check or the non-BT, fairly high damage really in the Bogart too. But again, you can still see some activity there. This is our test from 2018. And what we're, we're looking at here is cumulative fruit damage over time. So you can see very high damage in the non-BT and the wide strike. And you can see again, this is wide strike three, your VIP. This is a VIP, Twin Link Plus. This is a VIP, Bogart three, relative <laughs> to your dual gene. You know, you can see that little bit of difference from the VIP technology. And so, get, yeah, you're going to get more damage in your dual genes. Uh, the VIP's going to help considerably, particularly in, say, the wide strike three, less so where we have CRY2 toxins also involved. And if you look at yield response, so what we've done, we did here is we sprayed, we split these plots and we sprayed half of them. And you can see we got about a 30% increase in yield by spraying the non-BT. Actually, I thought the yield response would be a little higher with wide stripe, but we saw about a 15%, essentially none with the VIP technologies, and anywhere between uh, about 8% and 15% with the, uh, these two, two Gildene te technologies. But I, I, I'll point out on this test, though, it, it took, we had so much rain in 2018, it took us six, we defoliated this stuff, and then we weren't able to really get in there and pick it for about six weeks. And so that, that did have probably an influence on some of, some of our yields on some, tech, some of our varieties. So if we look at the, if we kind of combine all the data I have, so I'm gonna look at data that we had from 2018, and we're gonna compile it all together and look at uh, damage across eight locations. And so what you wanna see here with the different technologies, wide, wide strike, wide strike three, twin link, twin link plus Bogart two and Bogart three, this is the reduction in fruit damage relative to, a, to the non-BT. So we want that value to be as close to 100 as we can get it. And ideally, we want that box to fall within, 
within that green line, which is about 95%. But you can see wide strike, highly variable, and again, it's way below, it's way below that line. It's just, it's just not a very good technology anymore when it comes to Bogard, or I mean, when it comes to bowworms. The wide strike three, fall, it does hit the green line. All the VIP technologies hit that green line, and then your dual genes are gonna—they fall b below that that green line. So they're just not carrying the level of control that we would expect them to, as we have in the past. Now that doesn't mean, again, if you don't have a lot of worms out there, you're not going to see this necessarily. But if you have a big egg lay and a lot of worm pressure, then that's where this really manifests, particularly particularly on these technologies. So if you plant a wide strike, you got to watch that technology very closely. Real, uh, not, you still need to watch Twin Link and Bogard too, uh, but not uh, the, the VIPs, you, well, you're going to want to watch those too, but not to the extent as the other technologies. And then if you look at the yield change, again, relative to spraying, you can see, again, what we want to be as close to the zero as, as, as we can. So that means no benefit in, in spraying. And you can see yields are all over the board, which is just what you get with any kind of variety trials, particularly in a year like last year we had such bad weather. So the higher they go up here, the, the worse they performed, or the more benefit you get out of spraying. And again, it's your, it's your VIC technologies that fall in that zero range your dual genes are a little bit higher, and then the wide strike uh, tends to be highest, or the non-BT and then the wide strike. So if I'm going to categorize technologies relative to the different pests, and we're going to concentrate on bowworm here, you know, wide strike, I would say it's, it, it's fair. It, it, it's not completely kaput, but it's, it's close to being completely kaput. And that means you're going, to need, you're going to need to spray it fairly often under high pressure. Your, your dual genes, uh, Cry1A, Cry2, which is Bogart to twin link, they're good. And so good, you're gonna have to spray it. It's gonna be common to have to spray those. And then Wide Strike 3 and your other uh, triple gene technologies, we're gonna consider those very good. They don't hit excellent because we still see cases where, it just, where we see justification of treating these technologies, especially with Wide Strike 3, since so much of it is dependent on the activity of that VIP3 toxin. And what happens in cotton is that expression of, these to uh, of how good these toxins are expressed, it's going to vary over time. So if a crop's stressed, or if once you start getting close to cutout, there's a good chance that that expression is going to start to go down. And those are the cases where the worms are going to be more able to survive and, and cause injury. So I, I, want to, I want to go into corn now because what we see in corn is, what, is what's driving this system. We don't select for resistance in what we do in cotton. We just don't see enough survivorship, number one, plus we spray the heck out of it when we get them. So what's going on while we're seeing resistance to the BT toxins is, what's, is because of corn and what's going on in corn. So I'm going to show you a little bit of data on corn because what we see in corn is go, it's going to be the tip of the iceberg moving forward, particularly with regard to the VIP technology. Now I pointed out that one population I collect out of electric corn this last year and I'm going to show you what we found on that population. All right, this is, so what we're looking at here, this is percentage of ears with larvae. And we've got two non-BTs in here. We've got an intersect, which is a Cry1AB and a Cry1F, so that's just like wide strike. Then we have a double pro, which is a Cry1A105 and a Cry2, which is essentially that plus a Cry2. And then we have a Leptra, which is a Cry1AB and a Cry1F plus VIP, which is kind of like wide strike three for, for a good comparison. So based on what we know on resistance, for instance, Leptra is being carried probably by the VIP technology. These others, we would suspect, due to resistance, probably won't perform that well. And if you look at percentage of ears with larvae, well, there's a lot of larvae out there. You know, we're running 80 to 90% infested ears, even with these BT technologies, 
a little bit less in the leptra, but there's a lot, over 60% of the leptra had worms in it. And I, this is the first time I've ever seen this, and it just so happened to occur in, in one of our tests. Uh, this is the uh, average instars. So this is the size of the worm. So you can see that these in the non-BT, in the intersect, and the double pro, these are very large worms, fourth to fifth instar. That's, that's a big worm. You can see they're a little bit smaller in the leptra, but still they're over third instar. And third instar is, is, a, is a good size worm as well. And that's, we have, I've never seen larvae survive leptricorn beyond second instar ever until this case. And so what we did is we went in and collected, we collected over 100 larvae out of, uh, out of this leptra uh, test. We also tested to make sure it's expressing, and it was expressing the VIP, the VIP technology. If you look at the damage though, you know, so this is percentage of ears with damage, these, every ear we checked had some damage. And this is a viable kernels. I'm not talking about the kernels that are getting shot out the back of the combine. These are the, the harvestable viable kernels. And again, you can still see some significant damage as far as percentage of ears with damage in the leptra. But if you look at the extent of the damage, it's not nearly as bad. So what we're really seeing with that leptric corn is a lot of development up in the, in the, the tips. And in, with this particular variety this year, we, you know, we had some fairly good size uh, ear tips on, that, that didn't have viable kernels on them. So those larvae were able to feed up in there. They didn't get into the viable kernels uh, as much as, as these, these other ones did. So what we did is we took those larvae we collected out of that leptric corn, and what we're going to do is we, we're going to compare them to another population. We collected another population out of triple pro, which is the double pro, essentially with the root trait also, and we're going to compare those and how they respond to uh, the VIP toxin and, and see how much difference there are. And again, this just shows that it, th these ears are, that's, the, that's one of the larvae out of the leptric corn and that it is expressing the VIP, the VIP technology. So we're gonna compare these two. These were collected at the same time. This was probably a quarter mile away uh, from where this population was collected. And so what we're gonna show, I think, is that what we do, we're selecting these things in corn and we've been selecting the cry-resistant worms in corn and guess what we're selecting now? We're gonna start selecting the VIP-resistant worms. And so this solid line here, that's our worms out of our, our double or triple pro corn. That's the, the worms out of our leptric corn. This is concentrations of the VIP in this diet that we're putting on doing these assays. And it goes from 0 0.01 all the way up to 3.16 micrograms of the toxin. And this is your mortality. You can see a distinct difference in the response. You see, we hit 100% mortality here with the, uh, the double pro or triple pro collected worms, and it's almost, it's it's, it's it's almost zero at that point. We almost always get 100% mortality here with all of our populations. It really picks up at one, and then, of course, at the really high rate, which is a super high rate, it does in eventually kill them all. So there's definitely, we definitely selected for resistance in that leptricornis last year. If you look at the LC50s, that's the lethal concentration to kill 50%. Here's our triple pro, that's your LC50 in micrograms, 0 0.4 versus 0.84. It's a huge difference. And if we look at a resistance ratio calculated not against that, la that crazy laboratory strain, but against a real world population, it's about a 20 fold resistance. So it, there's, it, there, the genes are out there. We're, we're thinking that the VIP is probably not as durable as we'd like it to be. And as VIP corn becomes more and more popular, we're going to see higher and higher selection for VIP resistance. In, Tex, in my area of Texas last year, it was estimated we planted around 20, 25% of our corn in VIP technology. 
And when I talked to the corn seed companies this year, they were telling me that they thought uh, it would be much higher this year because uh, they were already selling out of the VIP technology. So I think we're going to see more selection for more resistance to our last toxin that's actually working. Now let's see what they do on leaves. We take that same population in that laboratory, a, diff, a laboratory strain, and we fed them on wide strike three leaves. And we left, we put newly hatched worms on there. We're gonna leave them for seven days. And we also did a non-BT. So you can see, you know, we're getting about 80% survival on the non-BT. The Leptra collected worms, we get about 42%, and very, very low survivorship of our susceptible strain. So again, high survivors, a lot higher than we like to see with these left collected worms. And again, they're, they're sizing up a lot better uh, than, say, a susceptible. So they're, they're, they're growing and maturing. So you, people, you know, so our, our answer really at this point is we've got to scout this cotton. And, I, you know, whether it's dual gene, triple gene, we've got to scout it, and we need to take action when we see these worms coming through. Um, so everybody asked me, well, how long is the VIP going to last? And I, we don't know for sure, but I can tell you what the models say. So when they model this stuff out, and I'm not a big proponent of models, but it's really all we got to go on. Right now, based on the fact that we've already lost efficacy in the, in the other cry proteins, we're looking at five years. And so that's not, it's not a pretty picture. And we're not looking for any new technology coming out for at least 10 years. So we're gonna have a gap, potentially a gap in there where we don't have good, good uh, insect, or insecticide activity out of our BT cottons. So we're gonna be uh, reliant on insecticides. And really our, our probably our, our most popular and best insecticide would be Prevathon or Besiege. This just shows a test we ran this last year in College Station, looking at Besiege at 17 or seven ounces, and it, see, Besiege is very—it's the same thing as Prevathon. It's—it's it's got a higher concentration, and they—they they put in—it's a mix, so there's a pyrethroid mixed in with it. That's a Prevathon at 14 ounces. These are compared to a couple of Blackhawks, but again, you know, the Prevathon that in the besieged, they, they tend to perform a lot better than, say, the Black Hawk in general. Now, the Black Hawk, do, it, it does work. We've got, I've got trials where it does work. It's not going to offer you the residual control, usually. Here we saw some decent, but most cases, it's not going to offer the residual activity that, say, you might get out of besiege or Prevathon. Now, this is another trial, and this shows, again, uh, untreated black hawk, intrepid edge, and then a, a Prevathon at 15 ounces. So, I don't know why some of those bars aren't really showing up, but in general, it's going to show the same picture, but the reason I threw this in here was the intrepid edge. And in what intrepid edge is, it's, it's, it's got radiant in it, and it's got intrepid. Intrepid is methoxyphenicide. It's also sold as a generic, as uh, the, that part of it is anyway, as Troubadour. And I heard of some of this stuff going out. It's not a good product. Now, the, the radiant part of it has the same mode of action as Blackhawk, but there's not, the, the rate is just not there in that mix to make it work real well. And that, the methoxyphenicide or Troubadour, and I heard of some guys in the, in the Northern Rolling Plains area trying to use Troubadour, it does not work. It does not work. It, it, the way bollworms feed, they just won't pick it up. It's not translate. It doesn't move into the tissue, and so it just it sits there on top of the tissue. They have to eat it, and so if you if you can't get it to where that worm's feeding, it's not going to work, and that's why it doesn't work. One more uh, graph to show where we got a lot of guys that want to use uh, a pyrethroid, and here we got a pyrethroid brigade mixed with acephate, and I want to show you this because of uh, what we see with that. At least in College Station, we end up seeing more worms behind these applications than what we saw with the check. And so, at least in my area, we discourage the use of a pyrethroid. Here's some intrepid edge. I actually looked a little bit better in this test in the long run, but again, Prevathon and Besiege tend to be 
your, your better products uh, you, right off the bat. And the reason, another reason I don't like that pyrethroid in that mix is you're going to stand the chance of blowing up things like aphids and spider mites. And what we're looking at here is aphid infestation. It's on a one to three scale. But everywhere we have a pyrethroid, whether it's here where we sprayed brigade and asphate or where it's included with the besiege or mixed in with Prevathon, we always see more aphids wherever we use that pyrethroid. Pyrethroids, and we see this in Milo too, you want aphids, spray a pyrethroid. So that's a big uh, uh, thing to look for, you know, particularly if you decide to use something, either besiege that's got the pyrethroid in it, or if you try to use a pyrethroid to kill the worms, you need to really scout out uh, closely behind that and look for an uh, aphid outbreak. Or, or really spider mites even. And another reason that we're real leery of pyrethroids, and I showed you it didn't work in our worm trial, is resistance. So this is resistance data we collected for pyrethroid resistance. And it's a vial, it's an adult vial test. So we're looking at percent survivorship at two doses of pyrethroids. And that, that five microgram, that's the discriminating dose. If they survive that, they're resistant. I threw in this double rate, this 10 microgram dose, just, just to see what we could do with a double rate. But you can see we've got resistance upwards of 40% uh, in, here in late July. That's fairly high. Uh, you know, to really have that down where you want it, you're gonna, it needs to be down around 10 or 20 uh, in general. But again, we're up here at 40% here. This is up by Commerce. And again, they had a blip fairly high up around 35, but it wasn't as bad as what we saw in a college station. Out at Wall near San Angelo, not too bad. And so under lighter pressure, they can get away with spraying a pyrethroid a lot of times. Uh, if I had real high pressure, I still, I still wouldn't use it. Uh, this is out uh, up in the South Plains around uh, Meadow and Wellman. Again, look, they had some fairly high early in the season here. And then in Lubbock, here in, in late August, they were, they were uh, approaching 35 36% survival, fairly uh, consistent. Uh, this is Hale Floyd County around Plainview. Again, uh, similar to what they saw in Lubbock. And then over all the way up in Muleshoe, pretty standard, you know, 35 to, to over 40% uh, to two evaluations in August. So, so pyrethroid resistance is out there. Uh, again, a lot of it is, is a numbers game. If there's not a lot of worms, you can probably get by with one you got to catch them really small to get the pyrethroid to work. And you can say this for Milo as well. If you want to use a pyrethroid for your worm control Milo, if you got any size on the, more, on the worms, then it's not going to work for you. So our treatment recommendations, at least in Texas, we've kind of split this up depending on what, what, you, what area you're in or what, you, what they're experiencing. In areas where we're seeing a history of BT failures, uh, and where we're looking at dual gene cotton, that's wide strike, twin link, or Bogart 2, we're going to treat on a 20% egg lay. We're not, we're not going to wait. Because what we've seen is guys that wait, okay, well, we're going to see what the worms do. Well, then they end up chasing worms, and the worms suck into that canopy, and they're in those fruit. And I don't care what you spray, once that worm's got size and is down in, those, in the fruit, you're not going to get very good control with, regardless of what you use. So we're, we're recommending that 20% egg lay threshold. For our VIP technology, we're still going to use a damage threshold. So if we're picking up 6% damage squares and or bowls with larvae present, that's our threshold on the VIP technologies. In areas where we're not seeing a history of BT failures, we're going to treat everything based on that 6% threshold. But what I'm going to do, if I'm in one of these areas, like if I'm in Altus, like uh, last year where they had some issues. If, if, if I'm hearing neighbors with issues or, or around or maybe just south of me having issues with worms coming through dual gene cotton, I'm going to switch to that 20% egg lay because timing is everything on getting good control. Uh, Pyrethroids, use them with caution. We do have resistance out there. Better make sure you're very well timed 
uh, with the with the pyrethroid. I, I'm very hesitant to re recommend them. In fact, most states have either taken them out of their uh, they have resisted have taken them out of their recommendations guides, or put a big asterisk that you know they could have resistance. Uh, I, my favorites are going to be Prevathon or Besiege. And really, we're, if you need residual control, so if you want, if you're in my part of the state where you need three plus weeks of control, I'm going to use a higher rate. I'm going to, I'm going to go with like a 18 or 20 ounce rate of Prevathon or a 9 or 10 ounce rate of Besiege. So in general, if you think about this as a rule of thumb, like for, for Prevathon, every ounce will give you that many days of residual control. So if I go with the a 20 ounce rate of Prevathon, I can expect about three weeks of residual activity out of that. 14, then I can expect a couple of weeks out of that. You don't, you can't go, you don't want to go less than 14, but if I'm not, if I don't need residual control, if I think I'm one and out or if I'm toward the end of the season, I'm not going to be hesitant to, to recommend these lower rates. They'll, they'll work just fine, but timing is everything. As I mentioned, you got to get those eggs or worms small, but, and once they really suck in, in into the, the fruit, then you're probably going to go want to go ahead and raise that rate a little bit to try to get a little bit more activity into that canopy. And with that, I'm done, and I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Well, pyrethroids work real good on them. Uh, again, it's, you, get, you may have the issue with flaring, flaring aphids afterwards. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this though, besiege, you know, it's got the pyrethroid in it. But keep in mind, particularly if you're using a lower rate of besiege, like that seven or eight ounce shot, there, there's not very much pyrethroid. It's a really low rate of a pyrethroid. And so if you've got worms and you want to say, well, I've got some stink bugs out there, and I want to clean them up. I'm going to use besiege. You need to spike that pyrethroid rate up a little bit because it's just a very low rate in that besiege mix. If I don't have worm issues, my product of choice for stink bugs and cotton is going to be biterin because it's extremely efficacious and it's not going to flare stuff. It, I, I have never, it actually has some aphid activity. Now, I've never flared aphids, I've never flared spider mites with bidrin. The other product that's, that's really good on them is acephate. Three quarters to a pound of acephate, depending on how many stink bugs you got, is very good as well. It's very cheap. As, and the problem with acephate is, again, you may flare aphids. But even more so, you may flare spider mites. So if you've got a few mites out in that field, you know, your asphates can be a little iffy. So if, if, it was, if you're thinking, well, that's, that's going to be my last go-round, what you could do is you could back off. If you're well-timed on your worms, you can back off that besiege rate to maybe a, a, like 7.2 ounces. I think that's, that's the bottom. And then just throw in some more of the of the pyrethroid to go up it a little bit because then, then your mix is going to be cheaper than a, than a whole 10 ounce rate and you'll save a little bit of money that way. Um, but again, it's really, it really depends, like if, if you got behind on it and you got some bigger worms out there, then using the higher rate's the way to go. Yeah, that's just the danger of the pyrethroid, there's no doubt about it. And if you can... <laughs> If you can keep, I know it's cheap, and that's why everybody likes it. But if you can keep it out of the mix, you got to keep it out. If, I mean, it's really it's a roll of the dice. You know, every time you do that, you know, you may end up blowing up aphids. I know what a lot of guys you. So in in Texas, we had a section 18 for transform for plant bugs. And most of our aphid infestations for, just happen to have plant bugs in them too. And that's what, that's what everybody used. Uh, just, and and it, it, it works remarkably well. But if you don't have that, your best product, I, I'll tell you, and I've done a lot of work with resistance on, in cotton aphid. Imidacloprid is not good. 
not unless you want to double the labeled rate. Centric is a real shot in the dark. It's very uh, um, hit or miss. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. And so I don't recommend either of those products. Uh, the Intruder or Acetamiprid, uh, most of the time it still works. And it's not, it's not a guarantee either, but, but I would say probably in our part of the world, it's you know, 80, 90% of the time it should be just fine, like an ounce, and I'd use an ounce. An ounce of Intruder works just fine. But if you if y'all had a section 18 on transformer and could find plant bugs out there, that stuff is really 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 good on them. Mm -hmm.